It's 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10, our top story. More than 30 people are killed in Ukraine in the deadliest attack on Kyiv this year as Russia targets cities across the country. It comes on the eve of a NATO summit in Washington attended by world leaders, including Sir Keir Starmer's first foreign trip as prime minister. Also tonight, the new chancellor makes house building the foundation of her first speech at the Treasury. We'll visit a development in Crewe where houses are not keeping up with demand. I think you can see today that I mean business. We're getting on with the work that's needed to unlock that growth. Lord Cameron steps down as the shadow foreign secretary as Rishi Sunak unveils his shadow cabinet. I'm not going anywhere. Joe Biden calls into a US morning show defiant over speculation about his future in the presidential race. But if any of these guys yeah. don't think I should let them run against me, go ahead, announce the announce president. Challenge me at the convention. The French president refuses to accept his prime minister's resignation, calling for stability after a shock election result sends the country towards a hung parliament. And England players rally around Gareth Southgate ahead of the semi-final clash against the Netherlands. Plus, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages. That's coming up in our press preview from 10.30 right through to midnight. Hello there, good evening. More than 30 people have been killed in what is believed to be the worst attack on Ukraine this year. Russia launched a range of missile attacks. A children's hospital was hit in the capital. It comes just a day before a NATO summit is due to begin in Washington and as Ukraine's president appealed to allies for more military help in the war against Moscow. Well, President Zelensky said Russia must be held accountable. And officials reported attacks in six cities across the country, killing more than 30 people and injuring more than 170. Sky News' data and forensics team has geolocated missile attacks to a business park, a private clinic, as well as the Okmadit Hospital, the largest children's hospital in the country. It's near to government ministries. Russia claims they were targeting military industrial infrastructure. Sky Security and Defence Editor Deborah Haynes has this report. This is meant to be a sanctuary for Ukraine's most poorly children. Instead, it's become a war zone. Trauma for the tiniest of patients. Young boys and girls battling serious illness now forced onto a new front line. The hospital basement is where many parents took their children for shelter as Russia launched a barrage of missiles towards Kyiv and other cities. But any kind of movement is dangerous for the most vulnerable. We first heard the explosion. It wasn't far away. We reacted quickly. My daughter started screaming. I didn't think this could happen, that there could be an attack on a hospital where there are sick children. Footage captured the moment the missile struck Ukraine's main children's hospital. Other images showed the aftermath. Russia confirmed its military had launched missile strikes against Ukraine, but said the targets had been military manufacturing sites and air force bases. No sign of either here. Nor at this residential block, also in Kyiv. We went to the corridor during the air alarm and we saw the fire and heard how the rocket was flying and the explosion took place. Ukraine's president called for more Western support on a trip to Poland. Ukraine is now initiating the convening of an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council in connection with the Russian attack on civilian infrastructure, including a children's hospital. Many see the attacks as a deliberate ploy by Russia to dominate the agenda on the eve of a major NATO summit of world leaders in Washington. This is 
par for the course for Mr. Putin to hit civilian infrastructure, and he doesn't care whether he's hitting hospitals or residential buildings. Um, I, I can't draw the line that, that this is some sort of message. But look, I mean, uh, as I said, what you're going to see over the course of the week is a very set of, of strong signals and messages to Mr. Putin that he can't wait NATO out, can't wait the United States out, that we're going to continue to support Ukraine. We are defending not just our homes and our cities and our country. We are defending every one of you because Putin goes so far as far we are allowed to go. The latest devastation, the starkest of reminders of what's at stake. Deborah Haynes, Sky News. Well, our Moscow correspondent, Ivor Bennett, joins me now, and our US correspondent, Mark Stone, is in Washington. Ivor, to you in Moscow first. Cruise missiles flown 50 metres off the ground, we're told. Ukraine opening war crimes charges. But what was the intention here from Russia? Well, first of all, there are differing accounts over what caused this destruction at the Children's Hospital in Kiev. As we've heard, Ukraine is adamant that Russia was targeting, deliberately targeting civilians. They say they have evidence and they say they're going to pass that to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Russia, though, says it did nothing of the sort. They've put out a statement from the Ministry of Defence in English on social media. They say they carried out airstrikes on defence industry targets and aviation bases in Ukraine. There's no mention of a children's hospital. They do refer to the footage that we saw in Deborah's report there showing the destruction. But they say that's the work of Kiev and a, and a Ukrainian air defence missile, appearing to suggest this was either a misfiring missile or a deliberate act of self-harm. They don't provide any evidence to back up that claim, but they do suggest a reason to garner support from NATO. I think whatever the truth here, what is clear, what is certain, is that Russia did step up its aerial offensive on Ukraine today. And I think the timing is no coincidence. Coming on the eve of this NATO summit in Washington, it feels like Russia is trying to flex its muscles here, trying to show Western leaders gathering there that they have the upper hand on the battlefield and that in their eyes it's pointless to continue supporting Kiev. Well, timing is certainly everything, Mark, and this certainly focuses minds ahead of this big NATO meeting. Yes, uh, the anniversary of NATO, 75 uh, years, the biggest meeting of its kind uh, here in Washington in probably three decades. All 32 member states uh, will be here tomorrow. And I think it is clear uh, that this was a message by uh, Vladimir uh, Putin. I think to an extent it was expected, and I think leaders expect that there could be more in, the, in terms of messaging, uh, in terms of bombing by President Putin over the course of this week as the summit uh, gets uh, underway. Uh, it is clear, too, that despite what what uh, the Russians are saying. It is the view of the United States and indeed of sources I've spoken to within the UK administration uh, that they believe this was not some sort of misfired missile by Ukraine, that it was uh, a Russian missile. It should be pretty easy to work out. You saw that image in, in Deborah's report of the missile hitting the hospital. Uh, within time, I think it will become quite clear what actually happened. But certainly the Americans believe uh, this was straight from the Russian playbook. Uh, devastating though it was, it only, uh, only underlines the unity that I think we will hear over the course of the next few days um, by NATO uh, leaders, a, a unity of a kind that NATO has not known in its history. Very, very united. What we will see over the course of the next few days is an articulation of that unity. What we will not see uh, is any articulation of how this ends. That, say NATO leaders, is not up to them. It is up to uh, Ukraine to work out uh, what sort of a settlement comes. I should tell you briefly, too, that uh, in the last few hours it has been confirmed that Keir Starmer will have a bilateral meeting here in Washington uh, on the side sidelines of the NATO summit with President Biden, an Oval Office moment, uh, and in the, um, the readout that the Americans gave, or the statement the Americans gave confirming that meeting, those two words, special relationship, uh, they were there, two words which, which every UK administration holds on very tightly to. Uh, it is indeed special, and we will see uh, that meeting between the two leaders uh, on Wednesday. Full coverage, of course, of that. Mark in Washington, Ivor in Moscow. Thanks to both of you. Now, the Chancellor announced the first steps of the new government today to deliver what ministers are calling sustained economic growth. Rachel Reeves was speaking at the Treasury, promising to take immediate action to fix the economy and focus on house building. In a moment, we'll look at the fight over affordable housing. But first, our economics editor, Ed Conway, has been analysing what the new Chancellor is offering. A new era begins. A new Chancellor, a new agenda, and she's keen to get a move on. 
We have promised a new approach to growth, ending the absurd ban on new onshore wind in England. Create a new task force to accelerate stalled housing sites. We will also reform the planning system. For her first major speech, Rachel Reeves gathered business leaders to hear her pledge. She wants to get the country growing again and building again. But that raises a question. When can people, particularly those who are nervous about having all this building happening, when can they ex expect more economic growth? Is that something that you might expect in a, in a few years, by the end of this parliamentary term? It's all fine to say that you want growth. Everyone wants growth. But you've got to will the means and not just the ends. You've got to take some of the difficult decisions. Those de difficult decisions have been ducked and dived and deferred for the last 14 years. I think you can see today that I mean business. We're getting on with the work that's needed to unlock that growth. New housing targets, more energy infrastructure. Strictly speaking, there wasn't a lot that was actually brand new here. But for business leaders, what really matters is that they think there's a chance this time around it might actually happen. The fact that they are planning to bring forward legislation and action on this before even the recess, it's not the novelty of the ideas, it's the desire to execute them, which I think investors will hear and which is very welcome. So why is Labour quite so focused on economic growth? Well, have a look at this chart. This shows you GDP, the level of gross domestic product in the UK, how wealthy we are. You can see the pandemic there. We've kind of bounced back since then. But now compare us to the OECD, so the rest of the rich world, and there's a big gap opening up, 6.3%. If you turn that into the amount per person, it's over £2,000. And the impact on the public finances, £58 billion in lost tax receipts. For this business in Walsall, making electronic components, the energy transition is a big potential opportunity. The problem is Britain isn't on the front foot. It's been fairly sluggish the last 12 months with high interest rates, the, the cost of finance have held back projects. So I think most UK manufacturers are in this sort of state at the moment where we need something to happen to get the economy moving again. The choice of housing and building on this Chancellor's first big day is hardly accidental. But it's hardly the only challenge facing her. Weak growth, strained public finances and long-standing holes in government spending. Her work has only just begun. Ed Conway, Sky News. Rachel Reeves there, who used her maiden speech as Chancellor to say that Labour would build 1.5 million homes in England. And housing is an issue which affects millions across the country, whether it is affordability or those who are opposed to building on green belts. Sky's chief North of England correspondent, Greg Milam, reports. The houses going up on the edge of Crewe are not enough to keep pace with demand here. 800 more have been approved on land nearby after a fight over things like how many would be affordable housing. It shows, councillors say, when it comes to planning, there is no quick fix. We do need those houses, no doubt about it. But you've got to bear in mind there is always going to be quite a long lag time between seeing those changes of new legislation on the ground. And I think it would be naive to suggest anything differently. And all the while, people are frustrated and, and trying to get into houses. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's families like Nicola Richardson's, 19-year-old Liana, one of three of her children, looking in despair at the first-time market. The two daughters, you've saved up quite a lot, haven't you? Thinking about deposits for houses, but, but then you look at the, you know, the amount that you would need for what's apparently mm. affordable housing, and, and it may be affordable if you've got parents who are earning 50 grand a year each. It just feels quite impossible, really, in this generation, in this world, how it is at the minute. Um, you, you want to, of course you do. You know, you, as much as we love our parents, you, you don't want to <laughs> live in women forever. <laughs> um, but it just seems pretty much impossible. The construction industry says any solution means having enough people to actually build those houses. We are going to have to massively increase the workforce. Now, the only way you're going to encourage house building companies to do that and invest in the people and the land needed is by instilling confidence that the policy environment will allow the industry to deliver. You won't be surprised to hear that there was opposition to building hundreds of houses here from the people who already live in the area. And for all the talk of crushing that culture of not in my backyard, overcoming huge opposition when it's about where people live in practice is a very different matter. And all the while, for so many, that home of their own 
remains out of reach. Greg Milam, Sky News, Crew. The Conservative Party announced the shadow cabinet today with Lord Cameron stepping out of the role of Foreign Secretary. So it's out with the old and in with the new. 335 new MPs across all parties, to be exact. The new Prime Minister met his 411 Labour members of Parliament in Westminster today after he ended his tour of the nations. Sky's deputy political editor, Sam Coates, has this report. <laughs> Meet the super majority. Thank you very much. Thank you. Keir Starmer's whopping 411 strong team of MPs. Over 200 of them here for the first time. The start of a new term can always be a bit awkward for some. But little wonder he looks so pleased to see them. <laughs> it's been a day of handshakes and small talk for the new Prime Minister. A visit to Stormont, the second stop on his tour of the nations, promising leaders here a new approach and a better Brexit deal. A different relationship with the EU, a different way of doing politics, and we go forward in that spirit. Hello. First Minister. From Hamda, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Then to Wales, wrapping his arms around a Labour First Minister who lost a confidence vote just weeks ago. Here in Wales, it's particularly important because what I said before the election is that a Labour government would be a game-changer because you would have a UK government working with the Welsh government delivering for Wales rather than the conflict that I think we've seen too much of um, over the last 14 years. It's not just the Prime Minister not pausing to draw breath. The whole government came to look hyperactive. There's the Chancellor's speech on growth, the Foreign Secretary in Europe, the Defence Secretary in Ukraine, the Health Secretary meeting the Dentist Union and the Home Secretary out on the beat. Thank you! That kind of public reaction doesn't tend to last long into government. Hello, Mars, you? And the reality of ruling is harder than photo opportunities. Prisons are near breaking point. Will criminals be let out early to ease the crisis? I'm extremely concerned with the uh, legacy that the Conservatives have left us with on prisons. All of those things are going to need to be addressed and to, fit, to be fixed. And the Prime Minister has said there isn't going to be a quick fix, but we're going to have to deal with the, the legacy that we inherit. After a straightforward campaign, now Labour wants you to see a flurry of activity. But the difficult decisions are piling up. Labour's got a record 411 MPs, half of whom are here in Westminster for the first time. And they are going to want to demonstrate measurable change, not least to ensure that voters return them again in five years' time. With this many people lining up behind him, Keir Starmer has a blank cheque to reshape British politics. But the public voted for change and will demand results. Sam Coates, Sky News, Westminster. Well, Sam joins us now. Uh, so hundreds of new MPs arriving today, Sam. The new Cabinet meeting tomorrow, and it fell to the old Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, to announce his shadow Cabinet. That's right. As we were saying, there's been a blizzard of activity by Keir Starmer and his Cabinet. But, Anna, none of the announcements that we've had so far are really anything like us on the scale of Gordon Brown in 1997 when he announced independence of the Bank of England, or even in 2010 with the eye-catching announcement by George Osborne and the Liberal Democrat David Laws that their predecessor uh, from Labour had left a note saying that there was no money left. So nothing on that scale. But I do wonder, Anna, whether that is automatically a bad thing, whether Keir Starmer's government resisting the drumbeat and the demand for new announcements and new gimmicks is necessarily what the public is demanding at this point, or whether it might not wrong foot the opposition. Just have a look at Rishi Sunak's cabinet, shadow cabinet reshuffle uh, this evening, essentially forced into keeping the, those who remain in the same jobs, promoting those immediately underneath upwards uh, if the secretaries of state lost their uh, seats at the election. And then a couple of very high profile departures, no more high profile than David Cameron, who has chosen to vacate the job of shadow foreign secretary. He said in a statement tonight that was clearly because you couldn't have a shadow foreign secretary in the Commons. There's literally no reason why that is true. Literally no reason uh, why that that is the case. Instead, it looks like key figures walking away from the shadow cabinet because they know what's coming is hard. 
Keir Starmer's government may be slightly unpredictable. It may not run at the same pace as many people expect or want, but the opposition are going to find the next few months and years really tricky. Sam, updating us there from Westminster. Thank you. Well, with just a few months until the US presidential election, Joe Biden is standing firm against growing speculation that senior Democrats are calling for him to pull out of the race. In an interview on the MSNBC's Morning Joe programme, Joe Biden said he was not going anywhere, challenging his critics to take him on in the Democratic convention come August. Our US correspondent James Matthews reports. The start of a working week on Capitol Hill. For a number of Democratic politicians, an increasing number, the job is to get rid of Joe Biden. To the stories told in this place, add the one about a president facing party calls to step down amidst concerns over his age. He answered them in a phone call. On a morning TV show, they had the president on the line. He didn't care what party elites wanted, he said. The voters were on his side. I wanted to make sure I was right that the average voter out there still wanted Joe Biden. And I'm confident they do. But if any of these guys yeah. don't think I should let them run against me, go ahead, announce the announce president. Challenge me at the convention. This was Biden campaigning in Pennsylvania at the weekend. Every performance now is a test of his fitness against a drumbeat of doubt. My name's Joe Biden. I'm Joe Fueled Biden's by his husband. debate performance and stories since. According to Axios, the president is provided with documents showing his path to a podium with pictures and large print. Joe Biden had texts of his own for congressional Democrats, writing in a letter, the voters and the voters alone decide the nominee of the Democratic Party. How can we stand for democracy in our nation if we ignore it in our own party? I cannot do that. I will not do that. They say that close family members will be the key influence on the president's next move. A rallying call from the first lady was no call to quit. For all the talk out there about this race, Joe has made it clear that he's all in. The working week has begun with a Biden fight back, but the fight goes on. He's put party democracy at the heart of his survival campaign. But as one critic put it to me, they did indeed back Joe Biden to be their presidential nominee. But they also voted to put Kamala Harris on the ticket, the vice president, tipped as a ready replacement. The fences are up in Washington, D.C. for the 75th NATO anniversary summit this week. Joe Biden will be its host. It is a big week in the business of the presidency for a president taking it day by day. James Matthews, Sky News okay. in Washington. Thank you. To France now, where talks are underway to decide who will lead the country as prime minister after a shock election result saw a coalition of the left emerge as winners. Well, the left-wing coalition known as the New Popular Front, which includes Jean-Luc Mélenchon's France Unbowed Party, came first with 180 seats. President Macron's centrist coalition called Ensemble was second with 159 seats and Marine Le Pen's national rally finished third with 143. In response to the result, France's Prime Minister Gabriel Attal offered his resignation. The 35-year-old only took the role in January. He is a member of Mr Macron's Renaissance Party and his boss has asked him to stay on in the role for now to ensure stability after the election. Political custom says the next head of government should be chosen from the strongest coalition. And right now that includes the Socialists, the Greens, Communists and France Unbowed. But Jean-Luc Mélenchon is unlikely to be nominated. Mélenchon is a divisive figure with a hardline stance on issues ranging from the economy to the wars in Gaza and Ukraine. Our Europe correspondent Adam Parsons is in Paris and has this report. France has awoken to political turmoil. In the midst of this scrum is Gérald Darmanin, Emmanuel Macron's most trusted minister, insisting there will be no deals with the far right or with the far left leader, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. The former prime minister, Elizabeth Bourne, another ushered through the melee. But the kingmakers now could be those from the left, socialists like Jérôme Gage. 
obviously the president is still in charge. Nobody asked uh, his dismissal. Uh, but we have to find something we have never, never done in France, um, what we could call the kind of coalition. And Dianaba Diop, freshly elected into parliament and insistent that France needs to recover from rancor. Uh, all the French people need us to be uh, uh, to the um, right place and to be stable uh, in this time. And um, we have been very frightened, but now we have some relief and we have to work on it. Monsieur Mélenchon? I don't know. The national rally favourites to win this election will now be only the third biggest group in the assembly their young president striking a tone of contrition and humility. I've made mistakes and I also share my responsibility for this result. I was the leader of the national rally both at the European elections, but also in this campaign. This nation, one of the richest and most influential in the world, now finds itself mired in instability and uncertainty. There is no precedent for all this. And so the MPs that we've spoken to arriving here have all said the same thing. There'll be no quick, easy answers. The question is, who will be the next Prime Minister? The present incumbent, Gabriel Attal, came to the Elysee to try to resign today. But he was told by the President that he had to stay on to give the country stability. In Paris, left-wing activism is often focused on this area. It's called Stalingrad. Here we met two friends. Constance voted left, Beatrice went right. She wanted to see Bardella as leader. On security and the well-being of the nation, he speaks really well, and we need a man like him to lead our country. France is very selfish, but I think at the moment we need to be selfish. Now they watch and wait, hoping for leadership. Do you think you will get a prime minister on the left? <gasps> But we will see that in a few days, but we don't know who. <laughs> I think they have to work a lot. The Olympics will arrive in Paris later this month. The city is still being spruced up. France is ever more in the global spotlight, but at the moment it feels politically rudderless. Adam Parsons, Sky News, Paris. A group of bereaved parents has written to the new government, urging it to address racial disparities in the rate of stillborn babies. Stillbirth rates continue to be considerably higher for babies of black or Asian ethnicities compared to babies of white ethnicity. Shaman Freeman-Powell has spoken to one mother whose daughter died just minutes after her birth. From the moment she got married, Vashali had longed to be a mother. But first, she had to fight cancer before embarking on an 18-month journey on IVF, which was successful the first time around. We were just really just so happy, and all we just thought all of this is behind us now, like we can just we can move on and we're going to bring a baby home in, in nine months. Despite her pregnancy being high risk, she says she was not properly monitored and concerns she raised were dismissed. Their baby girl, Jaya, was born at 22 weeks, but died just 14 minutes later. Her grief compounded by anger, as data suggests her race may have added to the risk. I think it's disgusting. Um, I shouldn't be more likely to lose my baby because of the colour of my skin. Like, you shouldn't, we shouldn't be losing babies anyway, but to know that you're, it's more likely to happen to me or to someone who's black because of their ethnicity it's just shocking. We're in 2024. You can see, they were too big for her anyway, but she was tiny. She is among parents who have written an open letter to the newly formed government to address inequalities in outcomes, as latest figures show that black babies were over twice as likely to be stillborn compared with white babies. Asian babies were over 50% more likely to be stillborn. And inequalities persist in neonatal deaths, with black and Asian babies more likely to die shortly after birth. I think it sends the saddest and the most unacceptable message to these women that actually the, the fact that their babies have a different colour skin doesn't 
they are they aren't seen as equal and as important as white babies and i think nobody would want that message or that reality charity sands supports the parents calls for targeted action by government and the healthcare system to address the inequalities an nhs spokesperson said it is unacceptable for black and asian babies to experience disparities in care while the nhs has made improvements we know much more work is needed to tackle inequalities. We are investing an additional £10 million of funding. Whilst Vishali hopes that sharing her story will serve as a reminder that behind every statistic is a family and their suffering is untold. I can't get pregnant anymore. It's really hard to, to fathom like how we've got to, you know, we're almost five years down the line now. Um, and... We're still empty handed and all we've got is a like a you know, a little corner for her in the house. Shimon Freeman Powell, Sky News, Preston. Let's look ahead now and the England squad is gearing up for Wednesday's Euro 2024 semi-final against the Netherlands. Despite being just two wins away from lifting the trophy, would you believe it? Gareth Southgate has faced criticism over his tactics and team selection, but defender Luke Shaw told a news conference today that the players love Southgate and that he has taken the team to another level. I don't really understand the criticism. Um, I think what he's done for for the country, for, for us as players as well. And, you know, I think he's really took us to, to the next level. I think no manager's really been as successful as him as, as what he's doing recently. Can't wait for that. Well, that was uh, Sky News at 10. Coming up, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's newspapers in the press preview tonight, joined by Ryan Saby, Deputy Political Editor at The Sun, and Ava Santina Evans, Political Correspondent at Politics. Joe, welcome to both of you. And certainly among the stories, we will be discussing this on the front of The Times. It's headline, Pressure on Starmer to Raise Defence Spending. Uh, back with that in just a moment. Wanna smell?